that starts in 1 Timothy. And I'm just going to read a couple scriptures. I'm going to go through 1 Timothy 2, 8, and then 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. So if you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'm just going to read through this. But I'm going to start with 8 and then come back to 1. It says, In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. And so first thing, as you've walked through those doors, I'm hoping that we have crucified our anger and any controversy that might be about us or contention that we have with other men and other women. It goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1-4, through 4, and this is kind of where it started. It says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. That's all. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So, men, if you would with me this morning, let's go ahead and stand. Let's lift our hands in prayer. And let's start this off the way that God designed our prayers in a corporate form of worship. Father, we come to you today with humility, asking, Father God, that you continue to draw the hearts of everyone that is around us. Father God, as we stand and we intercede on their behalf, asking, Father God, that not only did you withdraw them, Lord, but that you would help them. We lift up all those that are in authority above us, Father God, starting here at this local level, moving itself into the state, the nation, and this world, including, Father God, at the top of this authority, our president of the United States. Father, I pray that you would guide him, direct him, draw him, pull him, convict him, Father God, to lead this country the way that you see it to be led. Father God, I ask here today that you would move me, that I would die to who I am so that your word would come forth. Not one thing that I would say, Father God, would be outside your will for us here this minute. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated. I uh, want to kind of just start just a little bit. Uh, about what Pastor Bob has meant to me. Um, I've known Bob and Vicki well before I was in uh, the pastor position there at Pru. I believe that I was running around in a paintball ministry, I think is where it kind of all first uh, started. And this man is a, uh, a huge influence of faith in my life. I think that he knows that. The life that he has lived has been an inspiration to me and the things that they have done here in this city. Um, so Bob, it is an honor to stand here today. And I'm going to tell you something that I've only shared with a couple close friends is that, you know, when I resigned as pastor, God gave me that call and I knew it was him beyond a shadow of a doubt. I knew that it was him. I've only preached a couple times after that. And the first time that I was asked to speak, it was at my grandfather's church, the church that he built. And so out of obligation and honor for him, I spoke that revival. And then a little bit of time after that, another good friend in the faith had asked me to speak at his church. And out of obligation, I spoke for him. But today is the first day that I have spoke knowing that I was called, to, called by God to speak. About a month ago, I told a friend, I said, hey, God is stirring me to speak. I know that it is coming. And so when you called, it was the first time after I had resigned that I have been called to speak. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm scared to be here, which another friend of mine told me that I would hope that anyone that preaches is scared or a little bit nervous, right? Because this comes with great responsibility. Um, so anyhow, I want to jump into the message this morning because I'm just going to tell you, I'm not a great preacher. I've never claimed to be a great preacher, but I can read great scripture, <laughs> right? So just have your Bibles closed, buckle up. We'll see where this goes today. Again, I don't know if we're going to get out of here by lunch or if it's going to be three o'clock time for graduation. Um, I don't know if the youth pastor in me is going to come out. We'll be done in 15 minutes. I have no idea. But here, here's what I know is I have a word that I feel like God has led me to speak. No one's here by accident. So we're just going to jump into it. All right. So active faith, active faith in Matthew 5, 14. And I'm going to do a lot of reading out of the NLT, and I'm going to do some out of my Bible and some out of my notes. And so you're just going to see me kind of chase a little bit of this around. Some of it I'll go over quickly, and some of it I'm going to dig into. 
And we're going to start right here. It says, you are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You are the light. We are the light. A city on a hill, right? When we come together, we can light this city up. We can light it up. One of the first phrases about Cleveland that I heard came from Pastor Bob to me about Cleveland. And he said, this is a city after God's heart. I get goosebumps to hear that because of the things that God is doing and the things that God has done through this body right here. The people that are here today. This body that has come together and everything that is in front of it. And so I want to read just a couple passages of scripture that should be on every church's mission board. This should be our mission statement as a church. And I don't know that any church that could not claim this as their mission statement. But in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46, it says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and he'll say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will cry, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I'll tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now, a couple of things that scare me about this passage right here. This is not the context of where I'm going. It's almost just the foundation of where we are going. Is that you'll notice is that neither one of these, the sheep or the goats, understood where they missed it. Lord, when did we? Lord, when did we? And this is what scares me about where we're at as a church today is that when churches come together and they put mission statements together, it's just like the scripture is completely pushed to the side. And what we would rather do is hire a pastor or a board of people to get out and do these things of God rather than do them ourselves. But these people not knowing where they did it, it was an action of their heart. And where is it with you? Are you expecting a group to do it? Or are you out there actively caring, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick that are in prison or the sick that are in the hospital, those that are imprisoned? Is what's coming natural of your heart and where are you sitting? And that's why this ministry is such an inspiration to who I am. That's why it's had our support from day one. It's motivated me. And I see when I got the phone call. And I've had phone calls from all over. I was about more honored in that phone call to be able to speak to this group right here that has done these things for years than I have any other call that I have ever received to preach in their pulpit. Kel Marlowe, that's a correct statement, isn't it? He knew it because I told him. Huge honor. Because this is what ministry is. And when it becomes an action of the heart to care for those that are in need. James 127, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. In other words, don't let the world change your mind. The ministry that God has laid forward is simple. It's costly, but it's simple. And that is at the heart of who you are. Man, you guys are right in spot. You're right in line. So here, now we can get into the context of the message this morning and know this. This is what I feel like the Lord's like just pulling out of me to say to you this morning is the active 
faith offends the inactive. Active faith offends the inactive. Action always brings criticism, right? Amen. I've lived it my whole life. The minute you, you decide to do something, someone's always going to say something. The minute you reach out to a sinner, somebody's going to say something. That old Pharisee, that religion is going to stand up immediately. It pulls them right out of a crowd. It does. But we cannot. And I don't even know that I need to turn this personally as much as to corporately you as escape ministries as a body. You cannot let the offended or the religious neutralize or affect your faith in what you do. God has called us to be a city that is a light on a hill. And when we come together, those lights shining can illuminate this community. Each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, has been called with a purpose. And the enemy wants each one of us neutralized and faithless and that purpose starts with you and your family then it extends into your community your state your nation and your world every one of us called with purpose that ultimately starts in us and our families. And I, I just want you to listen to this. Because this is what really. It's just been a beat in my head. For the last two weeks. Individually. And our family. Extending itself to our community. Affecting our state. Our nation. And our world. No pressure right? That's a big. That's a big calling. That's a big purpose. Knowing that that has been. Placed on us. So what we're going to do today, we're going to take a look at faith. We're going to look at, at a little bit about what faith is before we get into what I believe that God's calling us to do. So let's take a look at faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. It's by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. And that's where our faith lies. It is in the evidence and the confidence of knowing and believing. Even though we can't see it the expanded bible reads like this faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we do not see it it's an evidence and it's a confidence and that's what faith is and in my hillbilly grammar simple definition of faith and what i'm trying to put down is this is trusting god in everything no matter what Regardless if I can see it, regardless if I can feel it, regardless if I can touch it, I'm going to trust God in everything, no matter what. Now then, let's look at what a little bit of faith can do. And I'm going to read this out of the message. I love the way that this is written here. It says, because you're not yet taking God seriously, said Jesus. The simple truth is that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed... Say you would tell this mountain move and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. So you take just a little bit of faith, the size of a poppy seed, the size of a mustard seed, and you know that there's absolutely nothing that you can't tackle. So we understand what faith is. It's trusting God no matter what in everything that we face and in everything that we do, knowing that just a little bit of that will allow us and give us the ability to tackle any. Thing that we come in contact with. So when that purpose and that calling that is on our lives, knowing that it has a global impact that starts with me, goes into my family, that comes into this community, moving itself to the state, the nation, and the world, understanding that, man, just a little bit of faith will allow me to function in that. So that no pressure, right, moment is like, hey, it's all right. Because this room is full of world changers. 
And the minute as, as, as believers we begin to understand that is that our steps and our actions, our words impact the world. Wow, how? Simple, little faith. Just a little faith. So how do we? Small little me. Because I love standing up against big guys. I love it. Because it makes me realize how small that I am. And how can a small little me impact such a big world? It's where my favorite story in the Bible comes in. The story of Shamgar. Who's never heard of Shamgar in the Bible? Anybody? Never heard? It's okay. It's all right. Well, we see it here in Judges 3.31. It says, After he had Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel, he once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. This guy's a warrior. Yeah, right? He's a warrior. An ox goat. And I, I wanted to see. I just... I'm going to step outside here for just one second. Not actually outside, but I, I don't even know. What, this, this is close. I don't know what happened. That, one might, that might be close. That's pretty close. I don't know. That's nine feet. But did you know that the ox ago, they say, was just about, about eight feet. And it was used to kind of prod that ox. And here you've got this common man that is working his field, ultimately sick and tired of the oppression, one to himself, but his family, his city, his nation, right? He's sick of this oppression. And so he decides to take things into himself. He's going to kill 600 Philistines. And that's just what the Bible says. Here's this guy working a field, decides to kill 600 Philistines. And they say that at the time in his reign, Israel was in peace. Simple, common man, working the field. He says, hey, you know what? I'm going to start where I am. I'm going to use what I have. So do what I can. Change this nation. So that's where we're at today. Kids, this could be dangerous. I might leave it right here. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. One of my favorite stories in the Bible and, and a foundation of who I am. I love the uh, Edmund Burke quote. All that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Albert Einstein once said the world is a dangerous place. Not because of those who do evil. Because of those who look on and do nothing. Someone asked me why I wanted to run for city council <laughs> some people will tell you that it was because Scott Rusher wanted me in there Scott Rusher will tell you that but the reality is is being tired of sitting there and doing nothing I thought it was time family lives here we love Cleveland it's a city after God's heart there's things to do right and Shamgar. He started where he was. He used what he had. And he did what he could. Finally out of the intro. Now we can get into the points of the sermon. I don't even know what time it is. 11.30 not bad. Start where you are. Start where you are. You've got to ask yourself two questions. Ask yourself two questions. The first question is this. Where am I? Where am I? And we can apply this to every part of our life. Every part of our life we can ask this question. Where am I at in my marriage? Where am I at in my career? Where do I live? Where am I at right now? Where am I at in church? Where do I go to church? As you begin to ask these questions, you need a reality check of where you are. We watch... TV, and we think our marriage is something that it's not. We watch TV, and we think that our church ought to be something that it's not. We watch TV, and we wonder about, oh, wow, Tulsa, they've got the gathering place. Second question. 
have to ask. And this is a dangerous question. What needs to be started? Where am I? And what needs to be started? What needs to be done in my marriage? What needs to be done in my career? What needs to be done in my community? What needs to be done in my church? And so many times we've always asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? And then in the same sense, the church ought to be asking that same question. It's not about what my people can do for me, but what can we do for my people? And that's where we're at. Where are you? And what needs to be done? There's some things that need to be done in your marriage. Evaluate it. What needs to change? There's some things that need to be done in your church. Evaluate. See what needs to be done. Here's the big part of question, not question, but point number one. Is we've got to quit worrying about where we're not. Amen. Amen. We got to quit worrying about who we're not. Yep. Yep. Who cares what your neighbor's doing? Who cares what the church down the street is doing? Who cares what's going on? I need to worry about where I am, not where I'm not. Where are my two feet? Where do they take a walk? Where is their impact made? And I believe this, that the majority of believers spend half as much, if they would spend half as much time worried about where they're at instead of worried about where someone else is at, we could get a whole lot more done. Yep. I've been in meetings and church meetings, sitting with other pastors and churches and committees that say, you know what, the church down the street's doing this. Maybe we ought to do this. You know, this no, what we need to do is focus on where we're at and the position that we play and do that effectively. And each one of us doing that same thing is where am I? I'm not concerned about what they are doing. Amen. But what am I doing? I love that as a kid and so many times your kids will come to you, well, well so-and-so has. Well, so-and-so does. And then the parents always responding, well, I don't care what so-and-so has and I don't care what so-and-so is doing. And as a parent to our child, it's a complimentary elementary principle that quit worrying about it. But then as adults and, and, and church members, we come in and we really do the same things. So let's worry about where Escape Ministries is. Let's worry about what Escape Ministries is doing. Understanding where we're at and quit worrying about what everyone else is doing. Second part. Use what you have. And in those questions of where am I and what needs to be started, you have claimed what needs to be started. And again, you can write that down. It's something I have to do because of my ADD brain. When I figure out something that needs to be fixed, I forget about it by tomorrow. I have to write that thing down. But you've claimed it. When you ask yourself, what is it that needs to be started? Write it down and put it somewhere where you're going to see it constantly. Now, you've got to look at what you have. So you've claimed what needs to be started. What is it that you have? I asked a question that rocked my world as a youth pastor years ago. It was actually in paintball ministry that I'd asked this question. I really didn't even know what the answer was. I was just kind of looking for the answer. But I asked the youth, I said, if you had only one dollar, one dollar and you needed to change the world, what could you do with that one dollar? And the answers were hilarious. But one of them brought me to my knees. And one girl said, it's easy. You just give it away. And some things, the things in our hands, they're small and they're tiny. They don't seem like much. But God is calling us to start where we are and use what we have. Might not be much in your hands. But a simple cattle prod in your hands could be a sword when it's put with faith. 
Faith always magnifies and multiplies. It always magnifies and multiplies. Look at David. We all know the story of David and Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, 48 through 50, and I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but there's a little part of this scripture that really kind of, it's amazing how you start looking at scripture and you've read it a thousand times and then all of a sudden you get in there and you're like, oh my goodness, look at this. But look at David in 1 Samuel 17, 48 through 50. It says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So what we have in our hand might be small, but when we put it with faith, it can become the very sword that kills the very giant that is in front of us, right? And he goes on, he says right here, he says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And here's the part that rocks my world. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. How many of us would have looked at that giant and said, I need a sword. I don't have a sword. All these guys have swords and they're sitting on the rears. This guy over here, he's coming at me and all I got is a rock and a slingshot. But when you put those simple, small things that you have in your hands and you put a little bit of faith in them, it can immediately become the sword that conquers the giant that is in front of you. Amen. And escape, I'm telling you, it might not seem like you have a whole lot. But I'm telling you, when you put a little bit of faith with a little bit of what you've got, God can do big things. And that's why we've got to put faith in every one of those steps. Understanding where I am, using what I have, knowing that God equips those that he calls. Hebrews 13, 21, he says, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ. And it never comes down to our power, but ultimately this. Hey, I'm going to start where I am. Use what I have, no matter how small that it is. I'm going to put faith in that and allow God to take that stone, turn it into a sword and start slaying those giants that are in front of me. There's a lot to be done, I'm sure, in your home. There's a lot to be done in your school. There's a lot to be done in your community, in this state, this nation, and Lord knows, this world. But when we start to use those small things that we have, that we can do, putting faith in those things, big things can be done through little guys like me and you. You're a little guy. Just a speck in the picture of this world. No matter how big you are right now, but God can do big things, global things through you. Still in you, brother. Big things. We put faith in those steps. I love Shamgar. Love him. And of course, just like not worrying about where we're not, we got to quit worrying about what we don't have. Yeah. You know? When asked to do something, I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of ability. I don't have a whole lot to offer. Well, you got something. Just give it to God. Put a little faith in it and see what happens. God can do more with your 10 minutes than you think you can. Just because you ain't got 10 hours don't mean he's not going to use your time. That wasn't in my notes. The third thing, do what you can. Hmm. I've lived a life where I've always felt like I had to do more than I could. That's a huge pressure. But you know, all God's asking is that you would do what you can. Just do the best you can. And that's where Shamgar was at. Is he was sitting there working his field, tired of the oppression. He said, you know what? I've got an ox goat. I'm going to slay these Philistines. What's the worst that could happen to me? I mean, the best case scenario for each one of us is we not wake up tomorrow, right? We forget that, right? Is that a life that's crucified and a life that is lost, there's really nothing to lose. And in Matthew 25, 
And I know I'm kind of getting to the end of my 10 pages of notes, but don't lose this passage of scripture. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. It says again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them. While he was gone, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. And it's amazing how God begins to give us gifts that's based on our abilities, right? And that's what I love about this story. Is that as he gives us things, he understands what our abilities are. So if you're sitting there with something really small in your hands, you need to understand something that God knows your ability. And I would believe this. And again, I don't know where that you're going to find this in scripture. But I would say that he's probably going to give the most money to the man with the least ability. So that it can be further multiplied. And he's going to give the smallest to the most gifted. Because he knows what he can do with one dollar. Can I get an amen on that? So if you're sitting here with the small, you need to understand is that it says the most desirable gifts are given to those that you would least expect. So you've been given little because God really knows what you can do with the smallest to get the biggest. That's a word for you guys today. So the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, called him to give an account of how they used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more, and he said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done. Good. Good. My good and faithful servant, you've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and he said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've earned two more. The master said, Hey, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. And I'm not going to get into all the pictures that we see in the scripture here, but know this is that the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well and what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we see here is that he's given each one of us a gift and a measure of faith already to activate that gift. Every one of us. Whoa. He's calling us to use it. And all he's asking is that we just do the best we can. And when you've only got a dollar to change the world, to make a global impact, don't look at it and say, well, I guess I'll buy a drink at happy hour at Sonic because that's about all it's going to do. No. Put some faith behind it. Give it to God and watch what he does with the increase of that very thing. Because what seems small in your hands put with faith can become the sword to conquer the giant. But could you imagine if you had the very thing to conquer the giant, but you didn't use it? Because you didn't feel like it was enough? What well, God's going to say, but I gave you a seed and I gave you an instrument. Put the two of those things together and you've got an army. And that's where we are. We've got to ask ourselves where we're at. Look at what we have and just do the best we can. You put faith in those things. And as we come together, this city will be illuminated. 
And then people's going to start asking questions. Amen. What's going on over there? Yeah. The lost are being saved. The sick are being healed. Those that have been entrapped and addicted are being set free. What's going to happen? Then it's going to multiply into your state. What's going on in Oklahoma? In this nation? And ultimately, globally. And that's where we are. That's why I find it such an honor to be here because this is a foundation and a ministry that is designed to reach out to those that are in need. It's the very heartbeat of God and who He is. And it doesn't matter what we possess. This building's been under constant renovation. Who cares? The most important part is who we are. He told us to love our neighbors. That's how people would know we are his disciples. He didn't ask us to build big buildings. He didn't ask us to build big worship teams. He didn't ask us to build big children's ministries. Didn't build big youth buildings. He didn't care about the cover of the floor. He didn't care about how many toilets you have or you don't have. He doesn't necessarily care about how decorated they are. I love going into the church. It looks like it was decorated back in the 60s. You go to the men's bathroom and it looks like a woman's floral shop. Yes. Are you with me? Do you realize God don't care what the color of your bathroom is? Amen. He don't. He doesn't care about the ceiling. He doesn't care about the stage. He doesn't care about your front door. What he cares about is what you're doing with the very seed that you've been given with the faith and the measure that he's given you. And ultimately, will you use that? Where are you? Where are you? And you gotta quit worrying about what you can't do. I love the story of the girl that's walking down the beach that throws the the uh, help me out. It's back in the ocean. Sand dollar. Sand dollar. It's a sand dollar, isn't it? Sand dollar. Those You're not going to save them all, but I'm going to save that one. And how many times will we look at big problems and go, what I do can't make a difference? But you could do a little bit. See, my family, we have a mission statement, and we're going to love God, love people, love life, and do all three at the same time all the time. And we can do that everywhere we're at. To every person we come in contact with. Because that's where we are. Whatever's been given to us in our hands, just simply the best that we can do it. Kel reminded me of a quote. He said, a true Christ follower produces fruit. That's a true follower produces fruit, right? And that fruit in return feeds. And that fruit in return feeds. Every one of us in here. So in closing, I wanted you guys to really understand two things because I do believe that you've got the foundation of what ministry is, is to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those that are in prison, the widows and the orphans. So here's, here's what I believe that you, you really need to hear. And I, and I don't care how elaborate anything that I say might be or not be, but know this, active faith Offends the inactive. Who cares? Who cares? Active faith offends the inactive. Who cares? Faith always magnifies and multiplies. Your purpose starts with you, then your family. Community, state, nation, and world. The things that escape ministry does affects this city. The things that this city does affects our state, our nation, and the world. The things that you do affect your family. So how can I apply what I've heard today? Like preach, what are you trying to tell me? 
sum it up. It's pretty simple. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. And just make sure that faith is involved in all three. Pastor, it's an honor to be able to show up, blow up, and just walk out. Yeah. <laughs> it's been good. Everybody, put your hands up. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.